What up, y'all? It's your hometown hero, Scott Lane, the Black Bruce Wayne, a.k.a. the real Adam Coleman. So, you ride with True ID. Uh, got a special guest here with us today, man. Um, for anybody who's been following uh, my blogs over the last, uh, I'll say, you know, maybe six months or so, they know that uh, I've kind of been on a personal project of just reaching back to some of the texts uh, from African-American literature and, and history and just really drawing, you know, philosophical truths from them and just, you know, just interesting insights and then just kind of putting them in blog form for you guys. And so I just came across somebody who's, you know, light years ahead of me in that department, particularly in regard to a lot of Equiano. And so I invited him on the show. He was gracious uh, to come on. And I'm really excited about, you know, what he's going to contribute uh, to this discussion here. So uh, we got a true scholar dropping in, about to drop gems. We got Dr. Eric Washington. How you doing there, brother? I'm doing fine. All right, man. I appreciate you coming on the show. Hey, my pleasure. Got you, got you. So uh, before we really uh, launch into it, uh, tell our listeners a little bit about who you are and you know your field of study and how you got into that field of study. Okay. Well, yes, I'm I'm uh, Eric Michael Washington. I um, <clears throat> I teach at Calvin College in, in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I've been at Calvin uh, for uh, almost 12 years now. I'm originally from New Orleans, Louisiana, so <clears throat> that's where I got most of my education until I went off to graduate school and um, got my PhD at Michigan State in uh, African history. So I'm, I'm a trained Africanist, uh, but uh, I also uh, teach and, 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 and do research in the entirety of the diaspora. Oh, powerful, man. Powerful. Let me, let me ask you a question, you know, given that um, I, I, there's, I guess comparatively, there's relatively f- few African-American or African uh, folks who hold a doctorate. You know, do you feel like there's like a fraternity among you guys? Like when you do encounter somebody who's, who's got those credentials, is, is there like a certain uh, bond or connection that you guys share? Yeah, I mean, yeah, to 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 a degree, especially those of us who uh, are in the humanities. Um, I mean, there, I think, relatively few <clears throat> African Americans who are who are Africanists. Um, I know a lot of of, of us. Um, uh, so yeah, there's there there's a bond, um, and then at, at where I went to school at Michigan State, I mean, there's a more special bond because, um, I mean, we we put out so many so many um, PhDs in in African history. In fact, we have the number one ranked uh, program in, in in African history. Wow! In in this country, so um, yeah, we we've, we've been doing it for for a lot of years. So uh, yeah, there there there's a bond and mm-hmm. mutual respect. So yeah, it's definitely a good profession to be in, and um, surrounded by some good, some good folk. I'm gonna ask this question here too because I have a theory about something. So I'm, this is a somewhat selfish question of mine. This wasn't in my notes, but I'm just kind of curious. You know, I mean, would you say that there's anything that um, people of African descent add to the world of academia, you know, at the doctorate level that you know, were it not for individuals like yourself, would otherwise not be a part of the academic scene? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, I, I think we we do present ourselves uh, from a specific worldview that that we have. Uh, I mean, we we do look at things differently than, uh, let's say, our, our European European American counterparts. Um, it also depends on uh, you know where we've come from. You know. Um, mm-hmm. The, I, I would say I don't I don't I don't I don't know the numbers, but definitely I would say most most of us, you know, we we're not we, we're not we're, we're basically first generation scholars. 
Um, right. It's 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 rare to, to come across someone in my field or in a uh, related field <clears throat> who who <clears throat> excuse me who has a PhD and whose parents uh, one one parent is also an academic. Uh, that's 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 not the norm. Mm -hmm. um, and for for most of us, you know, we're the singular uh, academic uh, in, in our family. Right. Uh, right. I mean, broad families, not not just the immediate family, but like the the aunts and uncles and cousins. Sure. And yeah. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so I think I think that does add something because yeah, we're we're, we're pretty much still breaking ground. Right. Right. Um, right. That respect and. If you look at the landscape of academia, outside of large state institutions, like an institution that I teach, you know, I'm 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 the only African American in my department. Um, mm -hmm. I'm one of a few African Americans who teach generally at at the college. So um, that's basically the norm when when you look out. At all the little liberal arts colleges, and even even some middle 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 tiered, middle sized uh, state state universities, mm -hmm. they're not that any of us, um, you know, holding holding strong. So right. uh, so we do bring, yeah, we we we, we bring a, a different type of mindset, different type of worldview to to, to our respective campuses. Uh, we do see things differently. Uh, we also advocate for uh, students of color, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, regardless, of who, regardless of who they are. They're not just African American, these black and brown students. We, we advocate uh, for them. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it's, 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 it's definitely important for, for students to see at least one, you know, <laughs> yeah, one right, right, professor right. of color who. Who's advocating for them? It it really does enhance their educational experiences. So, um, yeah, I mean, so we're, we're valuable. Sure, we're, sure. We're quite valuable. Yeah. And so what I'm thinking about is, you know, and, and and you can you can tell me obviously better than I would know just you know on my, on my end of it, but it seems to me that academia is very interest driven, right? So if somebody's writing that uh, doctoral dissertation. They're probably not going to write on something that they don't have some sort of interest in. You know, they, you, you want to write something that's advancing the field and something that you're probably I mean, maybe even if not passionate about, at least interested enough to spend time <laughs> and, you know, and energy writing however many pages. Right. And so it right. seems to me that somebody like yourself, for example, would be more interested in, you know, the, the writings of a lot of Equiano, you know, than somebody who doesn't feel some sort of cultural connection. Right. And that's neither a good or bad thing. But I think that if you don't have people who have a diversity of interests, then what's coming out of academia is not going to be reflective of the body of knowledge, you know, that's out there that we would otherwise have mm -hmm. access to. D does that make sense? Oh, yeah, that makes that makes that makes perfect sense. I mean, that's okay. that's what that's what we do. I mean, it's, it's rare to see um, people who research anything that's outside of their interest. Right. Uh, regardless, sciences, humanities, what have you. Um, yeah, I mean, definitely. And, and, and for, especially you know, speaking as uh, 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 an American-born person of African descent, mm -hmm. um, I mean, definitely we want to see, I want to see uh, the advancement of knowledge in terms of the lives and experiences in the histories of, of Africans, both mm -hmm. on the continent and and in the Western Hemisphere, so so yeah, it, it is it is driven by by interest. I mean, man, I mean, I I got into this field uh, driven by a personal interest. Mm -hmm. So and it's still like that. Um, I mean, what drives my research agenda? What drives what I think about? and maybe write about on a more popular level, it's all, it's all personal. And I, I've, I've really embraced that now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now point in my career where I don't have to worry about, uh, you know, tenure. I don't have to worry about that. So sure, I'm okay. free to, to write a lot of stuff that is very personal 
and connect it with history and, and, and contextualize my story with um, the broader historical context of 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 African peoples, you know, globally. So, sure, sure. Yeah, and that that does that does advance. Um, it does advance our knowledge, and that's that's. That's what academics are supposed to do. Sure. Hey, I just want to say thanks, man, because I was I was debating with a friend of mine about this the other day, and so now I've got an actual academic, you know, <laughs> on record verifying that I'm not crazy, you know. So I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> so let's let's get not into it, man. Let's get into it. Um, definitely want to get into this stuff about a lot of Equiano, man. I've mentioned him here on the show, and mm-hmm. I'm just excited to get to that. Uh, so you know, before we go any further, if you could just maybe kind of give an overview of who a lot of Equiano is or was and kind of maybe the overview of his story. Okay. Uh, what what we know about Equiano uh, basically comes from his his autobiography, his, his narrative, the, the interesting narrative of of the life of Alaw de Equiano, uh, published in 1789 in, in England. Um, so what we know about his birth, he tells us in that text that uh, he was born in 1745. Uh, mm-hmm. Now, there's, there's an issue with that uh, because if we, we believe that he is African-born, there's a big debate about that. Um, and it's from the outset, I do I do believe in the integrity of the text. Okay. So I do okay. believe that he was African-born. But I do not believe exactly that he was born in 1745, as he claimed. Mm-hmm. Um, he probably was born a little bit earlier than that, probably about 1742. Um, and this is what I even teach to my students. I said that he, I, we can't be sure that he was born in 1745 because, you know, West West Africans didn't they, they didn't have years, they didn't date. You know, ah, so right. they, they they were they were on the Gregorian calendar, right? You know, right. So they was they, was, they didn't have any any calendars hanging around in their homes, and and they marking off months and days like that. Sure, no. sure. So it, I think I think he he was guessing, um, and he came close. He came close. So, mm-hmm. but but nevertheless, according to the text, he says he was born in 1745 in what is now Eastern Nigeria, uh, uh, ethnically. He was Igbo, uh, one mm-hmm. of the largest ethnic groups uh, in in Nigeria, and um, in in the text, uh, he and his sister were um, were captured by uh, Arrow uh, uh, slave traders. They were a neighboring group uh, that lived next to his his his, his village, mm-hmm. and they. They captured, uh, among others, he and his sister, and he was. He it, it seems like for the better part of that that particular year, because he 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 claims he was about ten or eleven at the time. Again, I'll say he's probably more seven or eight. Um, mm-hmm. He went from household to household, um, in, in in that part of West Africa, eventually winding up on the shore, where. He sold to uh, an English slave slave captain mm-hmm. and put, put on a slave ship bound bound to the New World. Um, so then this is happening in the 1750s. Um, so he survives the the Middle Passage, mm. and he writes about that. He, he writes about his experiences on, on that slave ship. And he winds up in, in Barbados, the easternmost Caribbean island, which was usually the first stop for, for British slave ships. Okay, okay. And according to the text, he stayed there for two weeks. Again, this is, and I, and I think this also uh, supports the argument that he was much younger okay. than what he's claiming, because he wasn't he he wasn't bought in, in Barbados. Uh, he was probably he was good. He's too young, and he he would he would have been of, of little use uh, on a sugar. Uh, yeah, okay. Seven eight years old. You don't want to spend 
you don't want to, you, you don't want to spend that kind of money investing in in in, in, a, in, in a fresh water slave as they were called salt water slave mm. as they were called for a kid who really couldn't contribute until he was probably in his teens so mm-hmm. he was he he was passed over so he was what what's called a refuse slave and again as was common refuse slaves would be put on another boat and then ship uh north in the Caribbean and going into the Atlantic bound for the colonies, the, the, the British North American colonies. And that's just where we wound up, according to the text. He wound up in Virginia. Yeah, because my understanding is that the sugar the, the, the cane uh plantation mm-hmm. were, is a much harsher life, if if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Th- than what you would have encountered maybe here in America, is that right? Yeah, in in uh in the Caribbean working on a sugar plantation the the average life expectancy of an enslaved person, once he or she got to the island, he or she would live on average another six or seven years. Mm. That's that's how arduous it was being on a sugar plantation. And 90% of captives who went to the Caribbean wound up on a sugar plantation. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, okay. Yeah. So you see, Atlanta winds up in Virginia, and then then he he, he works a little while on uh, I think on a farm plantation, and basically his job was to like, pick up rocks, mm-hmm. move rocks, fan 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 the master while the master ate, you know, fan mm. keep keep flies up from him, mm-hmm. and then and then he's and then he's purchased by. Um, a lieutenant in the in the in the Royal British Navy, Michael Pascal, mm-hmm. and uh, that's really that, that that's a turning point in his life, and he basically becomes the maritime slave. Um, mm. and eventually, he, he learns how to read and write. He's baptized in the the Church of England. Um, then he's sold. Um, Pascal sells him to uh, a Captain Doran, and he goes back to the Caribbean, mm. and he witnesses a lot of atrocities that, that, that occurred on these different Caribbean islands. Mm-hmm. Uh, eventually, he, he purchases his freedom uh, in the 1760s. He's, he's able to purchase his freedom because he's, he's going from island to island, shore to shore, and enslaved persons, especially men, are able to able to do little side businesses so he uh, sells fruit uh he hawks uh different types of wares um he's got a lot of what we would call hustles going on gotcha. side hustles. okay he was, he was a hustle man back able, then okay yeah yeah gotcha. he's able to accumulate uh 40 40 pounds silver mm. to, to purchase himself uh i think, I think he purchased himself in 1763 i think um According to the text, mm-hmm. so yeah, he, he's he's free around night. Well, according to the text, he's about nineteen. But he might be a little bit younger, but okay. late teens, early twenties, he gets his freedom, um, and he does some more traveling. Eventually, travels up to the North Pole. Um, almost dies up there. Um, really, okay. has a lot of issues with with. Uh, with with colonial racism mm. uh, in in British North America, even even as a free person, um, eventually he's 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 converted. Uh, he's converted to Christ, um, and uh, from there he he actually wants to be a missionary, but that never happens. Mm. Um, he also wants to go back to Africa. That never happens. Mm. Okay. So, uh, but the publication of of his book in 1789, um, he 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 published this book at the behest of of, of uh, English abolitionists who knew him uh, in the 1780s in London, mm-hmm. and he writes he writes his his story basically as an authentic African voice who had been captured, enslaved, uh, mm-hmm. experienced slavery, mm-hmm. knew what it was like. And this was this was added to the the abolitionist voices, 
of the 1780s really to to suppress the slave trade. Mm -hmm. The initial abolitionist movement in England in the 1780s was not about abolishing slavery. It was about uh, suppressing the the, the slave trade. Uh So the text is a is an abolitionist tool. And so basically, uh, Ecclesiastes text becomes um, really the most powerful tool that would uh, bring about the suppression of the slave trade wow. uh, in, in, in England that, that occurred by a bill in 1806, but uh, became legal January 1, 1807. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so that's 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 an overview of Ecclesiastes. Man, that's, that's a good overview. It's a good overview, definitely, man. Quick question, because I want to get into some of his text. But yeah. uh, my understanding is that he joined up with a, another brother named uh, Atabak Kaguano, um and the Sons of Liberty. I think it was was that. I guess that would have been after he wrote his book, and and you know, were they did they have a, a impact? I guess as their own entity for abolitionism, or mm-hmm. how, how did that that pan out? Yeah, actually, uh, he. He knew uh, Caguano before uh, he wrote his own book. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Caguano wrote his text in 1787. Mm-hmm. And obviously, uh, Caguano wrote in 1789. But yeah, they, they arguably, I think they, I think they would have met in, in London. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Caguano uh, Fonte, he was Fonte born in what is now Ghana and uh, eventually made his way. To, to England after being being a uh, enslaved person for 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 a while, but yeah, um, Cubano, um and others, including Equiano, yeah, London. I mean, London was a hotbed of of um, you know free free African mm-hmm. ideals. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, it was basically the capital of the the uh, African diaspora mm-hmm. at, at that time. Um, so yeah, it, they, it was a seedbed of, of ideas, um, abolitionist thought. And so, yeah, they, they knew each other, uh, before Equiano wrote. I think, I think, yeah, the dimension of Guano is really to offer would be readers of, of, uh, 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 Equiano's narrative, some, some context because mm-hmm. Guano's text, uh, uh, thoughts. Uh, what's it called? Uh, sentiments. It? Thoughts and sentiments on the evils of, of slavery. Mm-hmm. Uh, published in 1787. It's it, it's it's more sermonic than uh, it is okay. narrative. Okay. Okay. Uh, he, he he he's basically preaching against both the slave trade and slavery. So he doesn't give us a lot of autobiographical detail. Ah, sure. Okay. So it's not it's not it's not really a story. Mm-hmm. So Aquino's narrative is different because it's narrative, it's story. It's I mean, there are points in 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 the text where he breaks off and and he and he's he's quite sermonic. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But for the most part, this is a narrative. Uh, whereas Caguano's uh, book. Is again, it, it's it's more sermonic. It's the, it, it falls within the the genre of, uh, of what literary scholars call a Jeremiah. Mm, so okay. it's, it's 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 a prophetic book that is meant to to draw the reader's emotions out. It 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 it, uh, it pulls on the heart as well as the mind. Mm, mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. And there are elements of that in Equiano's text, but not 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 so much as in uh, uh Caguano. But and I think also that I think there's evidence that uh Equiano would have would have known Phyllis Wheatley as well. Hmm, so okay, okay. I mean, there was a group of of formerly enslaved Africans in London huh. during the 80s that that quite influential so it was, it was like the harlem renaissance before the harlem renaissance you know the, the london renaissance kind of kind of a thing you know oh definitely yeah interesting definitely. interesting well i think that might be a good se- segue you know talking about the the uh sermonic nature of, of 
uh, some of Equiano's writings. I mean, obviously you've done a mm-hmm. tremendous amount of work on that. Um, maybe t- you know, talk to us a little bit about about the sorts of theological themes that you find in Equiano's writings. Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, <laughs> Equiano, to really understand the theology, it's almost, I almost, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to tell people if you ever read Equiano. And, and you're interested in his theological framework. Start in chapter ten, okay, and, and okay. then and then read read the the, the first chapter, um, hmm. because it's it's in chapter ten where he details his his, his conversion story. Mm-hmm. So he is Equiano is thoroughly what we might call reformed. Uh, definitely Calvinistic. Sure. We, we, we can also, um, because he he believes that um, God chose him um, uh, sovereignly. Mm-hmm. Uh, he believes that God has set His love upon him. You know, since the foundation of the world, before the foundation of the world, and that every 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 instance in his life mm-hmm. was part of God's plan, and that eventually led him to that salvific moment, that that conversion moment in seventeen, I think seventeen seventy uh, two, I believe, is according to the text. Is when it's when uh, he actually became a, a, a Christian, um, even though he had been baptized back in seventeen fifty nine. And thought thought he was living a Christian life, but um, no, I mean t- chapter ten gives gives you really the the essence of Equiano's theology, and I think that's that's what frames the entirety of the text. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I think it's good to know that beforehand, and um, and so yeah, he's he is definitely. Uh, I mean, I think I think he was converted through the preaching of of uh, of Methodists mm-hmm, in mm-hmm, England, mm-hmm. but it seems as though these were what we would call Calvinistic Methodists. Um, definitely, um, interesting. But Equiano remained an Anglican until the day he died. Um, huh. But still, he converted through. Through the that ministry of those Calvinistic Methodists who were around during during that time, um, so yeah, he's definitely you know Cal, uh, he's he's Calvinistic Reformed, however you want to however you want to call it, mm-hmm. um, evangelical according to the the definition of that day, mm-hmm. uh, okay. because evangelicals in 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 in, in the late eighteenth century in England. They were a subset of of Anglicanism, huh. and these are the people who believe that yeah you needed a you need to be born again. I mean you needed a real conversion experience in order mm-hmm. to start a claim to be a Christian. You just you just couldn't have been uh, baptized as an infant and confirmed uh, when you're like thirteen, fourteen years old uh, by right. just basically. Consenting to 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 the the doctrines of the Anglican Church or or uh, the Apostles' Creed or something like that, you needed to have a real conversion experience, and that's what Equiano offered in that tenth chapter. Mm-hmm. He gives us a step by step road to his conversion in that chapter, and he spell and they, he spells out his his theological convictions. Um, so, mm-hmm. yeah, I mean, it, 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 it's great reading. Definitely. <laughs> now, let me ask you this, too, because um, this, this is fascinating, man. So in what ways would you say that um, Equiano leverages his theology against the slavery and slave trade of his time? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Um, yeah. Equiano's, Equiano's theology uh, was rooted against enslavement and uh, and slavery, especially the type of 
of enslavement that we 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 witness history witness in in the new world uh chattel slavery mm-hmm, um mm-hmm. But yeah i think i think there's there's some i think there's some room for debate regarding if Equiano believed that all forms of slavery were um were illicit interesting mm-hmm. uh because he 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 starts in 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 chapter one i mean he he talks about um now his father had had slaves, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, but he also explains that among among the Igbos, and this would be uh, accurate uh, throughout West Africa, mm-hmm. is that people were people were enslaved because they had committed a crime, or uh. they, they they committed a, or they were they were captives in, in a war. People weren't uh, enslaved in a way of you know. Uh, just wanton capture that 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 wasn't that wasn't the, the that, that wasn't the way people were enslaved in general mm-hmm, I mean, that mm-hmm. would happen with the the increase of demand for by uh, for for enslaved africans by europeans along the coast especially mm-hmm. in the 18th century mm-hmm. but that's what that's Equiano gets caught up in that uh-huh. in that in that increase of demand so he's actually cap he's actually captured illicitly um but he spells that out, and I don't think I, the way I read the text, I don't think he's arguing that that type of slavery is biblically illicit. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think what he does argue is uh, this this sense of chattel slavery where one person owns another person in a way that's absolute right right yeah. mm-hmm. I, I think he's definitely against that um and uh i mean they're there and, and and he's i mean and, and also he is um he's quite forthright about about um making biblical arguments against against slavery um i mean there's one passage in in the text mm-hmm. uh at the end of i believe it's in in a chapter two where um, he 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 has he's, he's he's written about the 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 middle passage and he he survived that and mm-hmm. he is in in his memory he he he's remembering uh the separation of of brothers who were on this this slave vessel mm. and um, so he 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 breaks off from the narrative and yeah he he begins to sermonize and i'm I'm going to read this passage oh yeah absolutely um he says this he says i remember in the vessel in which i was brought over in the men's apartment there were several brothers who in the sale were sold in different lots and it was very moving on this occasion to see and hear their cries at parting and then, then then he breaks off and then he and then he he addresses those readers uh straightforward. He he writes, mm-hmm. Oh ye nominal Christians, might not an African ask you, learn you this from your God, who says unto you, Do unto all men as you would men should do unto you? Mm. Is it not enough that we are torn from our country and friends to toil for your luxury and lust of gain? Must every tender feeling be likewise sacrificed to your avarice? Or the dearest friends and relations, now rendered more dear by their separation from their kindred, still to be parted from each other, and thus prevented from cheering the gloom of slavery with the small comfort of being together and mingling their sufferings and sorrows? Mm. Why are parents to lose their children, brothers their sisters, or husbands their wives? Surely this is a new refinement of cruelty which while it has no advantage to atone for it, thus aggravates distress and adds fresh horrors even to the wretchedness of slavery. So Whew, yeah, that's I mean, tough right there. That, <laughs> that's tough right yeah, there, yeah. From that passage right there that, that yeah, he's 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 applying a biblical truth. Uh huh. You know, the great part of the great commandment. Right. Uh against the practice of enslavement, and in this, the context of separating 
uh, brothers from each other, separating families. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, in the news lately. Yeah, well, oh, wow. Hey, I, I was about to go there. I'm, I'm going to come back to that in a minute. You know, it's very interesting. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> trust and believe. But you know, I would just say this first is that what, what fascinates me, I, I've been studying up on the concept of the biblical concept of the Imago Dei, you know, recently just looking into yeah. how that uh, flows throughout, uh, you know, the, the biblical text. And I just think it's so fascinating hearing, um, you know, a lot of Echo talk, just basically describe his experiences and his observations, just the inhumanity, you know, of chattel slavery and how it really uh, militated against that Imago Dei, that image of God. And I think you, I want to say, I think you find in, um, you know, uh, like David Walker's appeal, for example, you, you find that mm -hmm. idea of the Imago Dei being appealed to as a basis for arguing against slavery, you know, in the, in the slave trade. Yeah. It's very powerful, man. Very powerful. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Well, yeah. So, so let's go there, man. Let, let me go there for a second. Um, since you brought it up <laughs> about families being separated, um, mm -hmm. you know, what what would you say are maybe some insights that you've as you've been reading through Equiano's text? Um, does there anything ever jump out at you that says, "Man, like this or that," that like, really applies to today? Like anything that you've gleaned from it that you you find could be transplanted to sure. our time and, and applies. Yeah. Yes, d definitely. And this is something that, man, this is something that I, I teach to my students. Mm -hmm. um, when Equiano receives his freedom, you know, he has, he, uh, he has to carry those papers with him. But life, life isn't, life isn't easier for him mm -hmm. at all. Uh, he writes about going to uh, Savannah, I mean, bad things. Happen. When he went to Savannah, bad things happened. Mm, okay. Even when he was when he was enslaved, he he got he got beat up and got put in jail for no reason, basically, than for just being a slave and visiting another enslaved person. And the master just didn't he quote unquote the master didn't like having mm -hmm. strange Negroes <laughs> on, his, <laughs> okay. on his property right. uh, uh, visiting visiting his slaves, but. Again, uh, Equiano is free, and he happens to be in Savannah again. And this time, uh, a drunken, a drunken enslaved man, uh, uh, Doctor Perkins, uh, you know, basically, uh, he 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 almost dies. He gets beaten, and wow. uh, and. And the thing is that he's, he's a free person now. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. if you're in the if you're in the Atlantic world and you are an African, they don't the the the, the assumption is that you are enslaved. Right. All right? right. Okay. You are enslaved. You have you have to prove that you're not enslaved. And even if you're not enslaved, still, what I argue, and I think I think I I, I think he he argues this implicitly from the text. But I argue this explicitly is that any African person, slave or free, is not just a slave to a particular master, but he's also or she's also a slave of the whole society. Mm, okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So any white person can do whatever he or she wants to another black person. Mm -hmm. All right. And so here's here's how I make the connection to contemporary times. Okay. All right. In, in Equiano's day, in the Atlantic world, you're, you're an African person, a person of African descent. You're, you're assumed to be an enslaved person. Mm -hmm. And let's say a, a U.S. context, particularly a U.S. context, you are a black person, an African-American person, a person of African descent. The society looks at you and says what? Potential criminal mm. you know we're criminalized mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we're criminalized and we're treated as such you know wow. we're treated as such wow Walked around in, in, in stores uh falsely accused you know yeah shoot yeah. first ask questions later you know all the the, the killings i mean from so from from trip from the high profile recent killings from Trayvon Martin mm -hmm. on down by police uh, and also by folks acting as though 
they are the police. Yeah. There's been a common denominator. It's the assumption of, 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 of black criminality. Mm. All right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The assumption of it because you're black. You know, Trayvon Martin, he didn't do anything wrong. Right. Yeah. The, the, the thing that he, he basically died for, for defending himself. Right. Um, right. Uh, Eric Garner. I mean, yeah, you, you can argue, okay, he should have been selling loose cigarettes on the streets. But come on. He's selling loose cigarettes on the streets. He ain't shooting nobody. He ain't robbing nobody. He had to get choked out, man. But he for, lost yeah. his life. Yeah, right. He lost his life. He lost his life because of that. Tamir Rice. Mm. And so for we can go on and on. Uh, Sandra Bland. On and on. Sandra Blair. Bland. You know, she eventually lose her life in prison because she failed to put out a cigarette while talking to a police officer. Wow. So... Yeah, it's that that is still a theme mm -hmm. for for the lives and experiences of, of people of African descent in this contemporary world. And it it, it is a is a direct connection back to the world that Equiano lived in. Mm, mm hmm mm hmm And so it's you know, I tell you, narratives are so powerful, man. It's so powerful mm -hmm. when if, if there's an established narrative uh, you know, particularly, you know, if, if you're a person, you don't have uh, you're not in proximity with, you know, other people from other groups. Then all you have to go on in terms of your perception is what you've been presented, you know, like whether it be through the media or, exactly. you know, if all you know about black people is what you see on BET, <laughs> you know, yeah. then, then you're going to have a very different perception of black folks than if you're actually in proximity with them and forming conclusions based on real authentic interactions you know and right. so that narrative right. is, is so is so powerful man it's so important let, let me ask you this and, and, and this kind of takes me to another thought I'm, I'm just throwing things out i love talking to people who are smarter than i am because then i can kind of you know throw my theories out there and, and get some perspective but so i think we tend to think about racism uh in a sense anachronistically Right. When we, when we look at the period that you're talking about with, with Equiano. And what I mean by that yeah. is it seems to me that when uh, Europeans first began to trade slaves, it wasn't a matter of like, yo, we hate all Africans. So we're going to go yoke them up and enslave them. It was just a matter of greed and prudence, you know, in a sense, you know, um, economic prudence. You know, it's it's cost effective to have people that you're not paying doing all the work. Right. And yeah. over time that. Uh, bleeds into, I guess maybe what we what we view racism as today. Like there was a progression. Like can you can you describe like how European culture kind of goes from just the, the more pragmatic uh, economic impetus behind the, tra this, the the slave trade into this cultural entrenched mm. set of negative sentiments towards right. Af Africans. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely. I I, <laughs> I argue, and yeah, this is not anything unique to me, mm -hmm. but the scholarship, the best scholarship that I've read is that, you know, the transatlantic slave trade does not begin because uh, the Portuguese hated the West, the Northwest Africans. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not the case. Um it was, I argue that it was, the, the trade begins really in terms of, uh, it, it's, it's an extension of the Crusades in one sense. Mm. Uh, you, have, you have this, this papal bull that comes out in the 1450s. Once uh, <clears throat> the Portuguese are making contact with, with uh, when, when, when they first make contact with uh, Africans along the Northwest African coast. So a little bit below what will be now like Western Sahara mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and that, that area there, uh, around Mauritania. Um, yeah, the Pope, yeah, 1455, uh, Pope issues this, this bull stating that, um, you know, Portuguese mariners and Christians, you 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 find Muslims or uh, as this term uh, other pagans mm -hmm. or pagans even you have a right to 
uh, colonized the land and enslaved the people in perpetuity. Mm. All right. Wow. This is the this is the document that Americanists call uh, you know the, the 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 doctrine of discovery. This is the document that that begins that that doctrine mm-hmm. that initiates that doctrine. Mm-hmm. Which Americanists look at and say that well, this is the this is the principle. This is the doctrine that allowed for uh, Europeans to colonize Native American lands, to enslave Native American peoples, and even to uh, try to extinguish, you know, through through genocidal means, right. Native American. Right. Yeah, I agree, hundred percent. But I also argue that. So this this doctrine was first applied in Northwest and West Africa, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. So it had nothing to do with what we would call race, because race did not exist. It wasn't conceptualized then as we conceptualize it now. Mm-hmm, in fact, mm-hmm. race was conceptualized in the middle of the 15th century as it would be in let's say the 18th century, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. So, so what what changed? What changed? That's, so this this religious basis of colonization and enslavement morphs, right? It changes, it shifts mm-hmm, mm-hmm. once we once we start to see, you know, Portuguese definitely Portuguese are the first involved in in transporting. Uh, Africans first to the Iberian Peninsula, right. and then eventually in the uh, 16th century to the Americas, uh, because because of, because, of, because of the Spanish, the Spanish desire for for laborers who are not uh, Native Americans, mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. Na- Native American populations are dying, they're running away, and, it, and also there's this moral uh, outcry against. Uh, this unfree system of labor that's happening very early on in, 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 in the Spanish uh, uh, colonial world. Interesting. Okay. In, in the new world. Okay. So, uh, so, so they, they have they, they they have to be this justification, you know, for 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 the transportation of Africans into the new world, mm-hmm. and like like Africans are coming from coming directly from uh, the, the, the west coast and west central coast of Africa. Uh, so this justification has, has to be created. Hmm. Why why Africans? Sure, definitely. Economics. Oh. But, but they can't say that in order to really have some type of moral ground. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it becomes well, all right, the heathens mm. and the process of Christianization. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the term heathen is loaded because it just doesn't mean someone who's non Christian. It also means someone who can be deemed as you know, uncivilized, yeah. uh, wanting, lacking um, in, in certain human qualities. Mm hmm. So when the British get involved in, in the trade in the 16th century as well, um, they begin to look at the people that they're dealing with in terms of Africans, and they see see the difference in, in color, mm-hmm. and they begin to associate um, things according to the skin color. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So blackness and, and, and the British use, English use at that time I mean, blackness was seen as something sully, dirty, um, <clears throat> evil, wicked. I mean, these these are things that Winthrop Jordan pulls out in, in his huge study, White 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 Over Black. Hmm. That was published almost fifty years ago now. Um, but he gets into the the, the, the connotation of, of the word black even prior to the English involvement in the slave trade. So. They brought those perceptions with them, mm-hmm. and they're, they're dealing with traders who are Africans, but they're not applying it to them, but they're applying it to the enslaved that that they're purchasing. That's interesting. They're putting them on, 
Yeah. Why? Why? Why is that? Like, what? What did? How did they make that distinction? Like, like, why wouldn't they apply it to the the traders? Oh right, yeah, that's that's a great question. I think I think they they're not, they're not applying it to the traders because they they see the traders as being on 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 equal level. Huh. Interesting. Because interesting. These, tra- these traders have wealth. Uh, right. Right. I mean, yeah. There's a uh, there's a whole lot more work that we can do as historians about these these West. African trading, these coastal communities sure, and yeah. these, these traders and how they interacted. I mean, uh, Ira Berlin, he wrote a, a fantastic article, I think that came out in the late 90s. He called uh, a work he did on Creole Africans. And he's focusing on, on those coastal communities and how these folk, you know, having initial contact with the Portuguese and then other Europeans coming along on the coast, how these folks would learn uh, Portuguese. Mm-hmm, they would mm-hmm. learn Dutch. They would learn English so that they could they could speak and trade with these folks. Right. And uh, they even adopted European dress. Uh, some of the the leading men would would offer their daughters uh, in marriage to to Europeans. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. Uh, this is a whole separate type of community. That develops because of, well, communities that develop because of this this trade in action. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So yeah, Europeans are not looking at the traders as saying, oh well, they're less than. No, 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 no. They understand that these traders are the ones who are in control of the trade. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. You're right. So obviously, the ones that they are dealing, the human beings that they're dealing, are less than. Mm-hmm, okay. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So. Now, that doesn't mean that some of these folks in these, these, these creolized communities aren't getting caught up in the trade, because they actually do, uh, some. But, but no, um, yeah, it's just, it's, 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 it's a power dynamic. Right. 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 It's a power dynamic. And so that, that feeds into it as well. That's why, that's why we cannot divorce the modern concept of race and racism from power. It's absolute. It's inherently. It's, it's inextricably linked. Mm, mm-hmm. You can't disassociate it with. So, if if you don't have power, you don't have racism. Mm, okay. Mm-hmm. You may have some prejudice. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You may have bigotry, but you don't have racism. Mm. You don't have racism. Power is involved. Power dynamic. That's involved. Uh, I think I, I want to quote him right. Uh, Tanahashi Coates. Uh, he says that. What did he say? He says that race is the. He says race is. No, he says race is the father of of racism. I think that's. I think I'm quoting him correctly. Okay. Um, because yeah, he, he talking about. This, I mean, this is a social construct. Oh and sure, right. As a social construct, it it has a history. Uh, it just didn't come about. Um, just. Yeah, I mean, what, what did he say? Uh, that's not that's not the quote I'm looking for, but um, yeah, he 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 does he does make that 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 connection there. Yeah, I've actually argued um, in some of my writings that you know that I, I think that that racism is actually more objectively real than race itself. Oh, without a doubt. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. No. Yeah. Exactly. Without a doubt. I mean, race, race, the concept of race is pliable. Um, mm-hmm. it, it, it changes because it, it's a social construct. Um, I mean, folks who were who used to be Irish, and Irish is seen as a racial category. Well, that's not that's not that's not anymore. Not not in, not in the Western Hemisphere. You're, yeah, true. You have Irish descent. Well, you're white. Uh, if you have Italian descent, you're white now. You're still white. That wasn't the case. Right, right, right. right. That was. <laughs> In the in the late nineteenth century, early twentieth century, these folks became white. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so it's, it changes, and we we got to recognize that. And so it seems like then that that British concept of blackness that they brought with them to the continent, uh, like that seemed to be kind of like the nail in the coffin in terms of uh, sealing the deal of of blackness, Africanness being this this lower. Uh, status, right? Is it, does that does that sound right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It changes. I mean, yeah. The 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 slave trade 
and yes, uh, but not but not just that, not not just the English. I'm, I don't I don't want to I don't want to make it I don't want to make it seem like it was just the English. Okay, yeah, sure, sure, right, these, right. Uh, the, the Dutch the Dutch had them too now. Okay, okay, <laughs> right. I got you. I got you. That's definitely had them too, um, and and the Spanish and the Portuguese to an extent, uh, but theirs was a little bit. This was a little different, um, but but yeah. Uh, no, the, the the trade, the slave trade, really changes things. Mm-hmm. Um, because yeah, you you needed that that you know, that moral justification in terms of why why are we trading in millions upon millions of these of these African bodies? Mm-hmm. You know how can how can we justify this as as Christian people? Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, you you have to you 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 have to dehumanize folk. Say, well, yeah, they're they're less than, and so part of the justification is that they're, they're coming into Christian contacts and they can become Christians. But but even that is is not not enough because because then in the 17th century, where there's debate about does does baptism uh, set an enslaved person free? Uh, well, the you know, Maryland and Virginia and uh, Jamaica, those those colonial assemblies all argue no. Mm, uh, mm. Baptism does not change the the status of the enslaved person. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, and I've, so I've actually that, uh, written on that yeah. as well. I'm actually got a guest coming up to talk about this further. How this perception pr- prior to you know the, that um, those decisions. That this idea that baptism would uh, necessitate somebody being uh, set free was the impetus behind so many slave masters opposing the preaching of the gospel to enslaved exactly. persons. You know, and so that's, that's, exactly. a, that's a whole powerful discussion there. But so yeah, I'm, I'm having you know, man, we, we got to have you back on the show, man, because <laughs> I, I feel like we could have got about another five more lectures out of you. But but I know I, I got <laughs> I got to commit to my time, you know. But I, I've just extended that, man. I definitely want to have you back on. But but before you go, uh, just let folks know how can they how can they access your work out there? I know you've got some writings out there and things of the nature. How can people get in contact with you and so forth? Okay, uh, definitely uh, the work. I've done with Equiano, I've, I've done uh, for popular audiences. So uh, there is there's a a, a three part series I've, I've done uh, on on Equiano, and if you just Google Google my name with with Equiano, just Google my name Eric Eric Michael Washington. Gotcha. Allow the Equiano, and those things will come up. Um, so yeah, they they it's a three part series. Um, other than that, uh, whew, uh, some of our other stuff. I mean, it's, it's out there. Um, I'm trying to think. Uh, so, yeah, you you have to buy some books. Okay, uh, <laughs> I hear you. Where, where I contributed uh, things to. Uh, so yeah, I mean, there, there's some stuff on uh, written on Black Baptist missionaries to Africa, and um, oh yeah, we definitely got to have you to yeah. talk about be back to talk about that. That's for sure. Yeah, so there, there's this. Yeah, I have, I have some stuff out both uh, you know my, my my academic writing as well as my more popular writing. So yeah, anybody, I mean, you can Google me. Uh, and usually, if you Google my whole name, I'll, I'll be the first hit. So, gotcha. Okay. Um, Excellent, man. Excellent. So yeah, that's, that's how you get this, my, my my stuff. Well, cool, man. I appreciate you coming on the show. And for all my listeners out there, I love you guys. Uh, definitely check us out on iTunes. You know, give us uh, some likes. You know, five stars. Let people know what we're doing. We're also on YouTube, Podbean, and a, a host of other uh, outlets. Uh, definitely check out my YouTube channel because we got some videos we've been dropping. We got some more coming out. And uh, as always, man, you know, um, I'll also check out my Patreon. <laughs> you stop by there as well, patreon.com slash Adam Coleman. But as always, we love you guys, man. And that's another episode in the books. Peace.